Uh, okay, so who, who's Enabler? Enabler is a consulting company. We uh, specialize in cloud, uh, specifically uh, with uh, K8s and GCP, AWS, and we're a CNCNF partner. Um, yeah, we've been doing this for a while now. So like I said, come check out the website. Look us up. All right, so today, uh, what I'll be talking about, short intro uh, into a few things, uh, like the k resource model and how it all works, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of using IAC within uh, K8s or via K8s. Um, then I'll be talking about Crossplane, uh, Kubernetes Config Connector and Terraform Cloud Operator, some best practices that I think are best practices. Um, there's no real best practices of yet for IAC in Kubernetes. It's still a fairly new initiative. So um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Okay, so firstly, we just got to get into some of the ter terminology here. Um, it can be a bit confusing because there's a there's a few things that um, uh, the IAC in K8 uses. Uh, firstly, if anyone doesn't know what a custom uh, resource definition is, it's just essentially a piece of code that you can use to extend Kubernetes. Um, via the API and create your own uh, custom uh, resource definitions. And when I say resource definitions, I mean, you know, that little thing at the top that says API and you put in alpha slash V1 or beta slash V1, that's what I'm talking about. Um, next, controllers. So what is a controller? Uh, essentially, it uh, helps uh, you to do things within K8s. Um, so that is... Uh, things such as uh, it looks at events and so on, and it will uh, allow you to do, uh, I suppose, event-driven uh, stuff, like uh, so a controller will look at the events, then go and do something else. Um, and then finally, the operator is essentially the combination of CRDs and uh, the controller. Uh, gives you an operator, which is essentially just an application that is running in Kubernetes that um, helps you do various tasks. And a controller, uh, uh, sorry, an operator can be anything from something that installs an application on uh, Kubernetes to configure something or to do some event-driven stuff, uh, whatever you want it to be. Um, lastly, control planes. And the reason why I'm talking about control planes is because we don't want to get confused between the Kubernetes control plane and other control planes. So essentially, a control plane is just um, a bunch of tools and programs that help you look at uh, various uh, monitoring tasks and so on uh, within uh, an application. So essentially, uh, I suppose it's like a workhorse for you to go and add things and so on if that makes sense. Um, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> so let's first talk about what um, IAC is. So if anyone hasn't heard of IAC, it's infrastructure as code. Um, so, you know, a fair few years back when the DevOps movement started, um, or essentially when AWS started uh, pushing out their web services, you got uh, infrastructure as code, meaning that you can uh, all right, I've been told to hold the mic up because they can't hear me, but uh, okay. Um, yeah, so essentially what uh, IAC was, was uh, a bunch of APIs you could call and then write your infrastructure as code um, and then call those APIs and create an instance in uh, AWS or create a, a database, whatever it may be. Uh, you could put it down as code uh, instead of all the click opsy stuff like uh, back in the old... Microsoft uh, VM days where you'd uh, spin up a VM manually and then click ops away, whatever you needed. Um, yeah, so on to the next thing, which is K8s. I hope everyone knows what K8s is here because we are at the uh, Kubernetes meetup. But if you don't, essentially it is a giant piece of software that helps you uh, manage your containers. Um, and not only just manage your containers, but it helps you deploy application and manage those applications. 
um, and also it's very extendable, so you can create and extend it to do what you want uh, with it. So essentially create operators and other custom resource definitions to be able to, um, I suppose, create custom applications and uh, have it natively work with uh, K8s. Um, yeah, uh, so what we want to talk about is, and this is what this topic is about, is uh, IAC and K8s. So when I talk about IAC and K8s, I'm talking about using the uh, resource model that is provided in K8s, so essentially YAML definitions to create your IAC. Um, so we'll touch about uh, about this a bit more um, when I go through the various different tools. Um, Finally, I need to talk about state. State management is very important when it comes to uh, infrastructure as code. Uh, so pretty much any tool that you can think of that is uh, infrastructure as code, CloudFormation, Plumi, Terraform, uh, all the tools that I'm talking about here, Ansible, they all use state in a different way. Um, and what I'm talking about in state is um, I'm talking about the actual uh, uh, all your code that is infrastructure, when that gets applied, it will keep that infrastructure as code information somewhere, and then you'll be able to um, use that to go and check against your infrastructure, if that's correct, detect drift or recreate it. Um, and there's different methods of storing that state. CloudFormation essentially uh, has its own model and stores it within AWS. Um, through the cloud formation uh, console and so on. Um, Terraform uses uh, a JSON file, stores it all in a JSON file, and you store that in some sort of bucket wherever you want. You could store it locally, but you don't do that. Uh, stuff like Ansible. Ansible will just essentially keep it as code in front of you, and it will try and reconcile what's been created to what's in your code. Um, so the state there is a bit different. Um, and Plume is much like Terraform where it keeps a state file. Um, don't know about any other tools, but um, if there is, let me know. I'll probably be able to tell you. Uh, moving on, some of the advantages of using uh, IAC in K8s. Um, firstly, everything's YAML, so uh, everyone loves YAML. <laughs> it's the new way forward. It seems like YAML has taken over. So CloudFormation used to be in JSON, now it's in YAML um, because everyone wanted YAML. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but uh, using YAML seems to be the, the way to go and it seems to be, uh, I suppose, the markup language that everyone knows and everyone uses these days. So uh, why not use it for ISC? Um, Environment progression, this is an important one. Um, when it comes to environment progression, traditional IAC tools, it can be difficult to, I suppose, give yourself some sort of environment progression where you go from uh, dev, non-prod, uh, to production, staging, wh whatever your environments are. It can be difficult to chain that all together using a CICD tool. Um, uh, I've tried it uh, in many places and, and it gets complicated quick. Um, hopefully using IAC and K8s um, potentially could avoid that. Uh, one of the reasons would be uh, is that you've got clear defined environments, I suppose, when you use uh, Kubernetes, which potentially could make it easier to couple your infrastructure and those environments uh, going forward. But uh, so that, that, that is a uh, an advantage, but also maybe a disadvantage too, because it can get very complicated quick. Um, K8 is very extendable. So if you're using uh, one of the tools, like I mentioned, Crossplane or um, Kubernetes Config Connector, um, it, if you want to, you can additionally extend that or add extensions to that. Uh, for example, with Terraform, uh, you pretty much got what you got and you can use it. You can't really extend Terraform. You can extend K8s and add uh, applications to it. So that gives you a benefit there. Um, moving on to uh, some, sorry, my, my screen's a bit small. I can't see it, so I need to look at the screen. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing is all the benefits of K8. So K8 is very scalable, um, self-healing. Well, can be self-healing for some places. Uh, 
And uh, like I said, extendable, uh, you've got monitoring, you've got all sorts of tools available to you when you use K8s. Um, so that's a huge benefit. Uh, when you use a tool like Pulumi or um, infrastructure, uh, sorry, Terraform, Ansible, you essentially just got the tool and then you need to add in uh, various things like uh, CICD to then deploy all that stuff. Uh, with, with K8s, you don't need to do that. It pretty much does it for you. Um, so the other thing is uh, you can group your code with your application. So one of the biggest, uh, I suppose, issues I've had when I've been working at various places is that you'll deploy an application within Kubernetes and you've got your, all your application code there, but then you have to go run some other pipeline to create a database, maybe some PubSub, maybe something else, uh, I don't know, CDN, uh, anything that you need with the application will have to be separate away from uh, your application code. And it kind of um, it gives you, I suppose, a bit of an issue when it comes to it. Your application might have to de uh, depend on that particular uh, IAC code to be deployed first. Uh, if you use uh, IAC in K8s, um, you can bring it all together and you can do it all at once and then you don't have to worry about dependencies. Uh, if something goes wrong and you wanted to redeploy it all, it's all there in one nice little group of uh, at, of, of YAML code, um, if you can call YAML code. Um, all right. Uh, finally, uh, not that I like to use this word, but um, it's a dirty word, cloud agnostic. Uh, <laughs> uh, in my opinion, there's no such thing as cloud agnostic. You can use tools, um, I suppose, to use multiple clouds. Um, and this is one of those tools too. So potentially you could use multiple clouds using um, Crossplane or, well, not Kubernetes can, Config Connector, um, but Terraform and stuff like that. So potentially you can, um, if you wanted to, sorry, I'm getting a, a raising at the back. What's up? Yes. So, so one of the questions was about yes. crossplane in in the chat here was about crossplane versus um, Pulumi comparison. Can you talk a bit about that? If you don't know Pulumi, uh, that's fine. that will come up in the in in the in the in a couple of slides time. So I've got an actual slide that's that's going through um, the differences or um, between IAC in in K eight and. Uh, and uh, traditional IAC, um, but yeah. So back to the cloud agnostic. Uh, so yeah, so you can you can potentially deploy AWS, uh, GCP, Azure, all from the one place, um, which can be handy if you if you do use a, a multi cloud strategy. Um, yeah. All right. Some of the disadvantages, uh, and the biggest one is it's K eight. So. <laughs> It's, it's very complicated, K8s. It's, it's not an easy thing to understand. It takes time to learn it, um, whereas more traditional ISC tools are quite easier. There's not such a huge learning curve. Um, so you've, uh, you've got to be careful there. Um, the other thing is that you need a cluster to run your ISC. So if you, if you need a cluster to run your ISC, you, I mean, you've got to put up some resources there. Um, but if you're already using K8s, then you're you're already in luck. You can you can go down the path of IAC and K8s. But I wouldn't recommend just spinning up a K8s cluster to deploy your IAC. Um, another disadvantage is state, um, and why I say it's a disadvantage within K8s is if you lose your K8s cluster, bringing your K8s cluster back with its state. Uh, it's possible because you can back up K8s using uh, various tools like, uh, oh, what's the tool called? Started with V. You know it, Pratik. Valero. Valero. That's one of the tools that you can back up a cluster. All the resource uh, uh, resources that you deploy, you can back it up. Um, so it is a bit of a problem because restoring a cluster isn't simple. Um, restoring a bucket that holds your state is quite simple. Um, if you've got, you know, uh, backups turned on and version management, it, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, yeah. The other thing is uh, um, the IAC structure. When you're structuring your IAC, it can be 
quite complex. Um, and when I say structure, I don't mean the code structure itself. I'm talking about the structure of, let's say, uh, when you want to create some org level stuff or some account or project level stuff versus other um, uh, different ISC uh, components. Um, when you're just using or having all your ISC uh, applications and, sorry, when you have all your ISC infrastructure and applications together, it's, it's easy, you, you can structure that. But if you're going to be going and creating all of your ISC uh, via K8, it, it can get complicated and it's just something to keep in mind and it can be quite daunting when you have to uh, worry about all of that um, infrastructure within, within there. Um, the other thing is K8's security is very complex, in my opinion. Uh, it's very easy to muck it up. Um, and if you're allowing uh, your ISC to have specific roles within K8s that give it enormous amounts of power, and when I say enormous amounts of power, I'm saying like, you know, potentially a role that has org access to all of your uh, accounts, um, yeah, it can be dangerous. So uh, getting that model correct can be a bit more complex rather than uh, using a traditional ISC model. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. So this is the question that I'll be answering from before. Uh, K8 uh, versus uh, ISC, traditional ISC approaches. Um, so uh, to be honest, there isn't much of a difference when it comes to what they provide. Um, the they, they both pretend. Uh, they both have multi-cloud uh, providers. And when I say providers, I mean, you know, a uh, provider for Azure, provider for AWS, um, GCP, or whatever other uh, providers you want. Um, yeah, Kubernetes provider even potentially, if you really wanted to go down that crazy level. Um, but uh, they both have multi-providers. Um, when... Uh, both have uh, pretty easy learning curves, I I think anyway, when it comes to just the ISC uh, part of the equation, not the k part of the equation. Um, uh, both have a large community support at the moment. Uh, so various IAC tools like Lumi and um, Terraform, Ansible have a huge amount of uh, community support and a lot of people know it. Um, it it's, it's roughly the same with... Uh, with uh, Crossplane uh, and KCC, they're starting to really go up there. Um, the other thing is uh, state management. It isn't that much different, um, essentially. It, it's still roughly the same. It's just a matter of how it's stored. Um, so really, there isn't much of a difference. The only difference really is one is in K8s, um, and K8s allows you to do things like you know GitOps, um, and, and deploy every, all your ISC through K8s uh, and traditional ISC tools, you'll have to go and uh, get another CI, CD tool to go and deploy all your ISC. So I think that's one of the main differences there. Um, so yeah. All right, so Crossplane, let's let's have a deep dive into Crossplane. So uh, Crossplane, created by uh, Crossplane, uh, it's open source, uh, CNCF uh, approved and, and you know, uh, supported. Um, and uh, how it works is that uh, it uses a, a group of CRDs, operators uh, to provision deploy and control um, and essentially uh, reconcile uh, your ISC uh, through the operator and uh, through your controller and your custom uh, resource definitions. So essentially what you'll do is install a operator um, within K8s um, and then you'll go from there and it will set up uh, and you'll be able to start setting up your ISC as code with YAML. Um, one of the things that is important to note um, is Crossplane is essentially installed into K8s 
And one of the recommendations that uh, Crossplane actually have is to install uh, your Crossplane into your application cluster. Um, and I'll talk about that in some of the best practices in a minute. But um, you, you don't want to have a separate cluster just for your ISC. Um, yeah, moving on. So oh, one thing I've got to say about Crossplane is that it's a, uh, a multi-provider platform. When I say multi-provider, like I said, AWS, Azure, um, or Azure, uh, I should say, uh, uh, GCP, uh, probably other things like uh, F5 devices or whatever you could think of, um, it has a lot of different providers. Going over to uh, KCC or Kubernetes Config Connector, um, it's only for GCP and GCP only. Uh, so you can't actually use this particular um, ISC through K8 uh, for anything else apart from GCP. It also was created by GCP and open source by GCP. Um, it was part of the Anthos suite and still is part of the Anthos suite within GCP. Um, so you essentially have to pay quite a bit of cash <laughs> to use it in GCP if you haven't used uh, Anthos before. So just again, as as same as uh, Crossplane, it uses a controller um, to connect uh, to install, configure um, your CRDs and your controller. Um, and then once again, you're able to then create uh, your ISC through YAML. Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, this particular one purely because it's uh, a single provider um, uh, tool. Uh, if I was to choose between Config Connector and uh, Crossplane, I would go crossplane. Um, also, it's tied to uh, to um, GCP quite tightly, and it's controlled by GCP. And, and uh, it's it says it's open source, but uh, really, the overlords are GCP, um, and they do what they want with it. Uh, yeah. Right, moving on. Uh, Terraform Cloud Operator is an interesting one. So this is not actually and this is why I'm talking about it, is not actually the same as the other two. This is more of a tool that allows you to use a cluster to create your Terraform code. So you're still writing Terraform. Um, uh, HCL, I think, is the, the language that you, that, that you use. So you'll be writing HCL uh, configuration to deploy your... Um, ISC, and the other uh, the other thing is that you need to use the Terraform cloud. Um, so if you wanted to go and do this without like for via uh, open source, uh, there isn't. You can't actually use it as an, as an open source tool. You actually need to use it with Terraform cloud. Um, so it's not like your traditional Terraform where you can go and uh, uh, just spin it up and away you go. Got another question. So what you're saying is that Terraform have, or HashiCorp have open sourced the operator. Yes, the operator. For their but, own evil ends. Yes. And they're, so, they're paid for cloud service. Yeah, so so I think they, they open sourced it so that you can have a look at it and see what's in it and, and so on. But uh, I suppose you can contribute it to it. But essentially, you need to use uh, Terraform Cloud with it to be able to... <laughs> I shouldn't be bagging it because I'm a HashiCorp ambassador now, so, you know, I'll get in trouble. Um, but, hey, I'm not telling any lies. That's that's what it is. Um, so, so essentially how it works is, once again, it uses an operator with uh, controllers and uh, custom resource definitions. You deploy it, and then you submit your code to Terraform Cloud, then cloud then pushes it into uh, your K8's uh, cluster and creates your um, code. So really, it's not the same as the other two, and I wouldn't really call this a true ISC within cloud, um, and that's why I called it out, because it kind of is confusing and kind of a, a bit of a lie when it says Terraform Cloud Operator. Yeah, it's an operator, but it's not the same as the others. I think it's a bit of a 
wolf in uh, a sheep's clothing. Um, all right. Moving on. Best practices. So look at some best practices. When should we use ISC in K8s? And I've got some strong opinions on this. Uh, I know Pratik has uh, and a few other colleagues have. Um, I'm not a strong believer that we should be deploying all of our ISC through K8s. Um, it has a place, definitely, but I wouldn't go and say, hey, I'm going to spin up a cluster and deploy, um, you know, a GCP org and all the projects underneath it or uh, an organization in uh, AWS with all the accounts underneath it. It's not something uh, I would use it for. Uh, what I would be doing is essentially using it as a tool to help me couple my um, application code with my infrastructure. So if I had a web application and I wanted to create a database or a CDN, stuff like that, I would use um, this tool and that's how I would use it. Um, yeah. All right, so once again, how to structure IAC. It's very important. Um, I could go on about this forever because it's very important when, when you come to uh, how you structure IAC. And when I say how you structure, structure it, I'm talking about segregation from other applications. So within um, Kubernetes, you really need to understand the best practices of Kubernetes too. So when do you use a namespace? Do you use a namespace for everything? No, you try and segregate your namespaces into application groups potentially or uh, other ways. Um, when do you use uh, secrets versus config mass, so on, so on. Um, there's a lot of best practices that you need to look at for Kubernetes as well as ISC. Um, and both of them, I could probably do uh, a full presentation on them. So I'm not going to get too much in depth with it. Um, Lastly, environment progression. And when I say environment progression, uh, so I would be talking about having multiple clusters, potentially multiple, uh, I don't know if you'd have multiple control uh, planes for uh, cross-plane. If you did, then you could potentially do environment progression in the way of I've got a dev cluster, I've got a non-prod cluster, and then I've got a prod cluster, and I would be deploying my ISC with my applications into each one of those. And then each application could potentially then um, have its environment progression. So I deploy an app to dev, uh, do my testing or whatever into non-prod for the staging, make sure everything's running all right, and off, off to production. And that, that's a really easier way to um, do your environment progression. When it comes to tools like uh, Pulumi and uh, Terraform, it can be a lot harder to do your environment progression. you really got to plan it out. Got another question. It, it's not a question, it's a comment. Yeah, comment. So in Pulumi, they have this concept of like cross stack, like you can mix stacks. Sure. Right? You can get yourself into a mess really quickly, but if you use it properly as part of your code deployment methodology, and how many times have you seen it used properly? How many times have I seen any of this stuff used properly? That's right. It's the <laughs> right. same as Terraform. Like how, do you, how do you see, like, I've, I've gone through different different companies. I've been at a lot of different companies with ISC. And one of the things they never get right is the whole environment progression problem. Uh, I, I really believe that this particular um, tool, which is ISC within K8s, could solve some of those problems. Um, yeah. But I'll, yeah, I, I, I take was, your point. Yeah, I was actually including Kubernetes in that. Sorry, when I, when I said zero, I was including Kubernetes. Oh, okay, <laughs> there we go. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I've talked about this before, which is the one of the important ones. I don't think you should be using K8s, uh, ISC and K8s purely deploy. All, all of your infrastructure, um, you're going to get into a mess. One, uh, you're going to have issues because you're going to have a lot of permissions within that cluster. And uh, security in a cluster is quite complex. If you don't get it right, uh, potential uh, for you know one namespace accessing another namespace or users accessing uh, another user, people accidentally getting access to service accounts they shouldn't, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, Potentially people don't even do any security in uh, K8s, which I've seen too. Um, and then you go and deploy this and then people can access uh, 
and do whatever they want, which can be potentially quite dangerous. Um, so I would strongly suggest segregating by application and, and using your traditional ISC tools um, to create some of the higher level objects that you need within your cloud. Um, finally, security concerns, which I've been talking about continuously. Um, so when it comes to ISC, regardless of um, traditional ISC or ISC and K8s, you really need to think about how to segregate those uh, service accounts or um, how to segregate your IC. So essentially, you don't want um, having a pretty much a God access, uh, you know, service account that can potentially give you access to everything. You want to segregate by either level. Like, for example, I, I've got a service account uh, that will only do org level stuff, potentially another one that will only do project level stuff, um, another one that will potentially do network level stuff, uh, so on and so on. So really got to think about security um, and, and that extra level on top of K8s can give you a lot of um, extra security um, and a lot of benefit too, because it, it's very, uh, how do I say, not complex, but it's it's large. There's a large amount of security within K8s. Um, so hopefully there's some good takeaways from this. Um, so hopefully everyone knows now what uh, ISC and K8s is. Um, if not, uh, come and hit me up afterwards and I'll try and explain it better. Um, Hopefully, you know not to just use uh, a full-blown cluster for uh, deploying uh, all, your, all your infrastructure as code. Um, and then uh, some of the pros and cons of, of using um, ISC and K8s. And of course, best practices, which really is still ongoing, I guess. We'll see what happens in the future. So the question was, uh, how do we use the GitOps approach in Kubernetes, uh, ISC and Kubernetes versus um, traditional ISC like Terraform. So essentially they're both the same. Um, the only difference is you're gonna be looking at setting up with, with your traditional ones like Terraform, um, you're gonna be setting up a CICD tool which is gonna do your um, GitOps. So you would look at tools like Flux or uh, Argo CD. Uh, to be honest, I don't know any other GitOps tools, but um, yeah, so you'd be using those two tools or something else that is on the market to do your uh, GitOps um, for your traditional ones. Whereas within uh, K8s, you can essentially just configure it with uh, the GitOps approach. Uh, once again, using Flux or Argo CD, uh, and then uh, uh, GitOps, uh, GitOps, sorry, GitHub actually offer. I think they offer it within Actions. I'm not sure. Pratik, do you know that one? Mm -hmm. GitHub Actions, does GitHub Actions offer, offer GitOps? No, no, not directly. Sorry? They sort of do. They sort of do, okay. So then, so then maybe that's another approach. But yeah, essentially they're both the same. So there isn't much difference. Um, it's just how you configure it and how you set it up. Uh, any other questions? Sure, I'll set up my laptop while you take questions. Yep. So probably take one more question. In the meantime, I'll just... So... The question was, uh, if you were to use cross-plane, KCC, something like that, um, do you need more resources on the cluster? Um, essentially, you should be always doing capacity planning on your cluster anyway. Um, I mean, Kubernetes is great and it's very scalable, but uh, there is an endpoint to your scalability at, one, at, at the end of the day. Um, so yes, you should always be doing it, regardless of if you're doing ISC within the cluster or not, um, you should always do, do some capacity planning. Um, and I would strongly suggest uh, looking at the doco and checking what uh, cross-plane or KCC uh, needs you to do um, for capacity, capacity planning. Um, but yeah, definitely yes. Okay, time to hand over to Pratik. Mm -hmm. so just, just before we do, um, yep. I just want to thank uh, our sponsors for tonight. So serious people, as Mika is up the back, say hi. Uh, 
they're actually pretty fun people they're not all serious but they are serious people oh, he's sick. sorry wow. <laughs> she's very shy I, I did say to her you have to go up the, the front and she didn't want to so we'll embarrass her from the back of the room so serious people are a recruitment and talent specialist in, Melbourne, in Australia um, so if you're looking for a job or you're looking to hire and grow your team they are the people for you and they have sponsored tonight. They put on the pizza. They put on the drinks. They've corralled these two guys together and put them in headlocks and made them present. So this is really important, you know, because it's part of community and, um, you know, community is important to me personally, but also to these guys, right? Uh, Pratik's going, well, me too. Yep. You know? But that's why you're here, man. Right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we really do thank um, you guys for helping make this possible, giving us this space, paying for stuff. Thank you. Right? Couldn't do it without you, man. Cool. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Um, thanks, Simon. And, yeah, we definitely really, really appreciate Serious People sponsoring the event because... As Scott said, we are a uh, community, um, and to you know host these community events, you need support of our partners, and Sirius is one really helpful, always willing to host kind of partners. <clears throat> All right, so um, I have to stay here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this topic of what we are going to talk next Sorry, is Kubernetes and where does it fit? And it's pretty much it comes from a little bit of my philosophical ranting when I do, when I go to client sites and, and I see broken Kubernetes installations. I mean, none of our clients have broken Kubernetes installations, but uh, it's, it, it comes from there. And it literally, a lot of us, even Simon and I have this conversation a lot of times where we sit back and go, wow, what are people actually doing wrong? And when we go through this, honestly, take some, the intention is for you folks to take some food for thought Turn your camera on. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so uh, hopefully you folks will take away some food for thought where you can start asking some questions in your organizations if you're using Kubernetes today or ever come across Kubernetes. So my intention is to give you some boundaries or some questions or some some pointers where you can start thinking and hopefully probably suggest few solutions as well as we go um you saw this oh by the way um i know i don't know if this is visible or not but there's a conference called programmable next week and there's a, a discount code called pratik sent me if you use that you can get some percentage discount on the conference ticket sorry shameless plug i have to do it um, because you know Conference people are also very supportive of our events. Um, anyway, so let's go through this. Let's go through Kubernetes. Let's go through where it fits. And hopefully, we can come to an understanding. And then I'll also talk about genesis of something called Educate. It's a new initiative at Enabler um, or from Enabler. And I'll give you a very brief idea about what it is. I promise it won't be a proper sales pitch. But um, cool. All right. So who are we? And again, one slide about Enabler. We are cloud engineering and platform consultancy. Um, Melbourne's, uh, I think we were the first Kubernetes certified um, partners or providers. Uh, but long and short of it is, what all of this means is, over the period of last many years, we've been building clusters, cloud, uh, cloud platforms and everything at many, many places, including large enterprises. And we, we know, or we have like a blueprint or some ideas what bad might look like. Fine, everyone is still finding out what good will look like, but what we absolutely know what bad will look like. So we can help you um, avoid those pitfalls. Um, so the way we will do this is we'll go through the history of Kubernetes. Let's go to the very beginning, go through the journey, figure out what Kubernetes is, then finally try to understand where it fits. Now, all of you, I expect all of you to know all of this by heart by now, but still, let's just go for a common baseline, right? So the history of Kubernetes is, Early circa, let's say 2002, uh, Google was using Linux process isolation. They had their own internal mechanisms and they used to use something called process containers. 
Now, Google folks were very, very smart, very smart people. I never doubt that. Very smart people doing this madness with process containers. They, they, were, they, they invented this system called Borg. I think all of you would have heard about Borg. It was the first ever container runtime. Again, at this point, it was internal to Google. It wasn't outsour open source, outsource, open sourced, uh, but it was internal to Google. And I think Borg came, around, came about around 2005-ish. But the issue with Borg was there was a lot of custom tooling that was created after the fact because it was not properly planned. It was just, let's create it. Oh, it actually works. Let's create a lot of tooling. Then Google went through more iterations and then they created something called Omega. And Omega became this very well-planned thing, which was not working. So the irony is the Borg wasn't very well-planned, but it was working. It is still what GCP and Google is based on. Whereas Omega was very well structured, decoupled architecture, everything was microservices, nano services even, but didn't deliver the promise, right? And then this small um, company which started, um, which was called Docker Inc. We have a representative from Docker as well. Um, they just brought container to masses. They went, you know what? You lot are doing this process container. We are going to wrap it in an API make it consumable by everyone so that normal developers like me can just Docker run, Docker whatever. And they brought it to the masses. And as if an explosion happened, the world, world went berserk. We were packaging everything in container after that. I even knew, a guy, I mean, I know that guy. He, was, he used to transfer video files by packaging it in a container. I'm like, what are you doing? Have you heard of this thing called USB? But that was the madness of containers. But the beauty of it, the flip side of it is, it, it provided you a unified interface. You could be writing Java, you could be writing Python, whatever have you. Word docs for that reason. Um, but you can package it in one single way. You can package it in a container, start moving that container wherever you want it, right? Was unified. There was no different way of doing it in Java, different way of doing it in Golang. There was just one kind of way. Um, and it attracted, it was very DevOps, developer and operations friendly. At that point, we were still going through that developer operation silo, chuck over the fence kind of a situation. But it was friendly for both because as an operations engineer, I was like, wow, in production, I don't need to worry about this Java version, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I can just run a container. As a developer, I went, I can control my dependencies by myself. So it was very friendly. <clears throat> Again, an explosion. Um, but the question was, okay, fine, so many containers, how do we manage? Because literally look at that diagram below, everything was now being packaged as containers. And I kid you not, everything was literally being packaged as containers. Like people were spitting containers at the speed of light. That's just too much. Um, and then suddenly you started seeing this shift in infrastructure industry as well, where we, instead of hosting VMs, obviously, now we started running containers. Cloud providers started to build their container engines, and this container orchestration came about. Um, and around DockerCon, not around, or in, during DockerCon 2014 is when Kubernetes was announced, right? Again, the reason I'm going through this history is just to set the baseline, and maybe we will figure out where Kubernetes fits. But it was a rushed release. Google knew they had to release it, or else it, AWS was going to take over the world, right? So they released it. And you will not believe this. Today, we know how complicated Kubernetes is. But in that release, it was just replication, load balancing, and scheduling. Like super, super basic version of what Kubernetes is today. Today, it's a behemoth. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely plain as simple. And I don't know how, how if you folks have ever looked into Kubernetes' source code. Go have a look at it. It still reads like Java because they were rushing. And it's written in Golang. They were rushing, so they just ported Java into Golang, open source release. So if you go and have a look, there, there is actually one file. I, I used to remember the name of the file. I don't anymore. But there's one file which has around 1,000 lines of if-else ladder. If-else, if-else. You just look at this and go, somebody tried to write enterprise Java here. But anyway. Again, going back to Kubernetes. So yeah, it was released, but the purpose of it was very simple. To provide orchestration capability to containers, replication, load balancing, all of that, right? But eventually, eventually, 
and we know this today, it became, it evolved into a container orchestrator of choice. It is sad truth, honest truth, whatever you want to call it, it is container orchestrator of choice. Now, each cloud provider today has a managed offering. Even the likes of AWS, they came up with their managed offering, EKS. Um, Kubernetes is open source and CNCF governed, but jury is still out. Is it Google or is it CNCF? Anyway. Um, but if I were to, again, when people ask me, what is Kubernetes? Yes, it is a container orchestrator. It's a tool that you can run in your cloud provider, whatever, whatever. But when I think about it, it's a framework. And something Simon said earlier as well with controllers and everything, you can extend it. That's why it's a framework. You build your internal platforms based on this framework. It's not just install Kubernetes and all your problems go away. You will not achieve world peace by just running Kubernetes. You have to make an effort, build something around it. But as, as I said, the beauty is it's extensible in nature. It's API driven. You are not uh, fiddling with databases or whatever, just API calls via, uh, via CLI. That's what Kubernetes is. Which results in, all of these features result in portability. Portability meaning you can schedule a container and wherever you can run a cluster of Kubernetes, you can run your container. Could be on-prem, AWS, GCP, Azure, Alibaba, Oracle, and many other clouds. Sorry, I can't iterate all of them, but you get the drift, right? gives you the portability. As long as you can run a cluster, you can run your application workloads. It gives you resilience against failures, right? Um, if your workload, you deploy your workload to Kubernetes, it fails, Kubernetes will look after it, which is where the workload management and scalability comes into picture. But the end of it, it's all API driven. That's the key. That's the key which as platform administrators and people who use Kubernetes, we need to remember. It's API driven, treat it, as, treat it as such. Let's not shell into it and start modifying it. It's API driven. So if you look at, if you look at all of those things, right? Like what we've discussed so far, the history and what it offers, it should, the naturally in your head, it should lead to world peace. It should lead to where your developers are absolutely happy. They're like jumping up and down and just happy as Larry. It should lead to that if you have Kubernetes, you are an elite Dora performer. For folks who don't know Dora, Dora is kind of like the industry standard framework, which as Simon said, I can do a talk in, on its own, <laughs> but we won't go into it. But you can be an elite Dora performer you can have super happy engineering teams because whatever all the things that we looked at about Kubernetes, it means our team should be happy. We should have scalable, secure, and resilient infrastructure. But, but, and this is the sad truth, right? What I have seen in many places, and trust me, I've been to many places, I've done many uh, analysis or uh, uh, well-architected analysis, assessments of clusters, but what I've seen in many places is you end up with this. People just want to have everything. The ecosystem is growing immensely and it is not wrong. And by no means, I say that having any of these tools is bad. That's not what I'm saying. But ultimately what we end up doing as platform administrators or Kubernetes administrator, we go after tools. We need to install this tool, this tool, this tool. Okay, all right, it's not working. Install another new tool. Tools will never solve all the problems. Tools are also never the problem, yeah? So why do we why 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 do we do it? Why do we literally do this? What drives this? My belief is, and this is my belief, my opinion. Please don't. <laughs> this is no detailed research. Is somebody said it in a conference? Mm -hmm. That go run cross plane or go run this new tool or go run that new tool. That's literally how that ecosystem has grown. And unfortunately. And this is very, very unfortunate. What it leads to, where we get to, is complex developer experience. People are confused. We've got tons and tons of tooling. People are confused as to which one I'm using, how am I using, what's my consumption interface. So for instance, if I have a Java application, which is ready, containerized, I want to run it in your cluster, which of these 10 tools do I need to go and configure, set it up, observability, uh, security, and all of that? Because we've been building a complex ecosystem. We are thinking 
from inside outwards. We need more tools, more tools. And a lot of our time is just spent in managing these tools. Like literally, I know many organizations which spend hours, if not weeks, if not months, just managing Prometheus. Like why? Brilliant. I love Prometheus. It's very, it looks very good on my CV. But why? Are you in the business of managing Prometheus? Maybe not. Maybe you are. Who knows? But there are questions you need to ask. And this is the irony, right? Kubernetes, if Kubernetes is supposed to solve all the problems, you will see in the industry, large platform teams stood up just to run and manage Kubernetes. Now, your title could be platform engineer, SRE, the DevOps, whatever. At the end of the day, they're all managing Kubernetes. Again, don't take this as a blanket statement. I don't mean all companies are doing this, uh, but yes, majority are, right? To a degree where platform teams have hundreds, if not 200 engineers, which is just insane. Wasn't the tool supposed to solve our problems? Wasn't managed Kubernetes going to solve these problems? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, go. Uh, yeah, so the question was, wasn't managed Kubernetes supposed to uh, solve the problems? It was. But the issue is we've got into this tool sprawl or a tool soup that now just managing our ecosystem is an issue. Um, another thing it leads to, and literally that photo sums it, sums it up, you will end up with frustrated developers. You will end up with frustrated engineers. Burnout. You will hear this word a lot, burnout. That is a fact. You might be thinking we've got a big team in our uh, uh, office. We are definitely serious about this, shit, but you will be burning out people. And trust me, it has happened to me as well. I've been involved in some of these teams. And at the end of the day, you just go, I can't, I can't do much. Flip table, walk away. But the clever people in business have solutions. The clever people in business say, just add more people. <laughs> what can you say? But anyway, so yeah, what it should have led to, it's quite literally the opposite. And again, I'm painting a very grim picture because that's how you do. Scare people, then so you show them the solution and sell. That's, <laughs> that's the sales process. So let's go back to the original question. Where does it fit? Where does Kubernetes fit then? What is it good for? Probably I will give you some answers about where does it fit, but more importantly, I will leave you with the thought process around it and you figure out if your Kubernetes is fitting in the right space or not, right? And I know it's not necessarily answering the question, but hey, come for the next talk. <laughs> um, literally the honest, honest response I ever get. So as a consultant, uh, many companies, when, when we go in and approach, pe approach people, first question is, I want Kubernetes. My first question is, why? What are you doing? They're like, no, we want to be cloud native. I'm like, okay, why? No, because our competitors are on Kubernetes. I'm like, this, st stop, right? Go back to the first principles. Go back to the needs analysis. Go and talk to your team. Do they even need Kubernetes? Trust me, and again, I am not exaggerating this. I've also seen places where they containerize static websites, run them on Kubernetes. Trust me, I am, I am not at all joking. It happens. And you just go, okay, I'm a consultant. Fine, let's do this. <laughs> but take a step back, go and talk to your teams. What are they doing? What do they need? And a common scenario, and apologies if this is not visible, Probably I'll share this photo later. But a common scenario is a dev team. If you think about any dev team, anywhere, any company, primary responsibility they have is they want to write code, right? They want to build that feature. They want to build something that gets released to the customer and drives value and delivers value. But what we they end up doing is they have to think about resiliency, observability, CICD, security, and how to run the workload, right? Now the solution is, yep, DevOps, get hire some DevOps and they will fix it. But again, largely the team is responsible for that. Now, if one dev team is solving all of this, you, you folks have worked at many organizations, right? Or would have been, or are working at organizations. No organization has just one team. You'll have multiple teams that will have similar requirements, right? Everybody wants resilience, everybody wants security, everybody wants CICD. There are common problems to solve. 
And the common thread is, do they, each team need to solve all those problem domains, all those buckets? Does every team need to come up with a solution of CI, CD? Or is there a way to patternize this? Or is there a way to commonize this and provide them some sort of a way where they just worry about writing code and you can take care of the rest? And when I say you, I mean the platform teams or the engineering teams, cloud teams, or whatever you want to call it. A very good example is uh, literally, this is a quote from my a very good mate. <laughs> very innocently, he says, I hate networks. It should just work. My, my, yes, that's a very honest request. But do you know how much effort it takes to get a network stood up and working? He's like, I don't care. I just want to write my features, my code. I don't care about your network. Why is it always your DNS busted? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's a million dollar question I don't have solution for. But again, the question is not important. The intent or the emotion is very important where devs don't want all the responsibility. There are some developers who are power users. Fine, involve them. But if you're thinking about where does Kubernetes fit in my architecture, stop thinking about Kubernetes. First, think about your problem domains. Think about what your dev teams are doing. What is, what is that common thread? And the answer will emerge. I'm 100% sure. So hypothetically, let's just say your dev teams do a code and configuration, a little bit of code and configuration. The ultimate end goal is it lands with your customers, right? Over here. Wouldn't it be perfect? Like there was this thing in between which did everything, looked after resiliency, looked after security, looked after CI, CD, or provided some sort of capability, API-driven capability. Can I have one? <laughs> It's a mythical uh, creature, this one, but yeah. But if, if, let's say, we were to even define some of the aspects of that thing in between, what would it look like? And I reckon it's very simple. You need to think about you know, a development team, if their life cycle, if you start mapping their journey, there are a couple, there, you can break it into, let's say, three or more than three phases. But broadly for me, there are three phases. You need to build something. You need to then run that thing somewhere. And you need to operate that. Now, operate, you can call it, no, 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 we don't do operations, we are SRE. Fine, SRE, that thing, whatever. But And there are dimensions to each one of these, right? Like when you say build, it should be very simple, consumable interface. What I mean by that is if you, let's say as admins or, cube or platform admins, you install a big fat Jenkins server and expect all your developers to log in and copy and paste and use the console to do the CI CD pipeline, I think that's a failure. It has to be simple, consumable interface, API driven. I should be able to use an API, poke a pipeline, write a YAML, because we are all YAML stitchers, as Simon said, apparently. <laughs> right? Um, it should be an integrated tool chain. I don't want, if let's say in a CI pipeline, you have stages for, let's say, uh, code analysis, vulnerability scanning. I don't want to tool hop into five different places. Should be one place. Me as dev, I've already got way too much. I just plug my code in. It tells me what's wrong or builds the code. From the run part, sorry, there's a question. It's a Scott question, so it's not an easy one. So I want your answer, but I want the answer from the room and online as well. Do you feel that the CI pipeline is now the new shell script? <laughs> It has always been a shell script. So again, this is something I used to say back in the day, all CIs are glorified script executors because at the end of the day, you're just building something, but, but, but exceptions. So one of the things I'm in, I'm in love with GitHub Actions these days. So maybe it's just something different for me. Maybe it will change in a few years or a few months, but GitHub Actions is one of those where, you know, yes, you are executing a script, but there's a lot you can do with scheduling your workloads, with what you can do with your repositories, the security scanning and everything that's baked into the platform. Releases. Releases and everything. So yes, whilst most of the CIs are executing scripts, um, the feature add, the value adds is what the differentiator is. I know it doesn't answer your question, Scott, but it's your question. Um, so another dimension of platform, um, and probably we'll whisk through some of this, is run, right? 
running your application, it needs to have automated provisioning. Gone are the days where you used to copy, we used to copy jar files into a system and then run that system. These are gone. It has to be API driven. There's no negotiation of, about that is a key dimension of the run side. And finally, operate side, you have to focus on the, your uh, customer journeys. Like gone are those days again, where you were just monitoring CPU and memory and that would have done. That would have been more than sufficient. No, you have to monitor your customer journey. You could be clocking 99 CPU, 99% CPU, but if your customers are happy, that's a win. You could be clocking 10% CPU, but your customer are going, uh -huh, I can't, this is not working for me. So think about those things, right? And that's where how you will land at an answer, where does Kubernetes fit? Obviously, this is a cheeky slide. Kubernetes is the solution. No, I would, I would not go that far. But again, a cheeky slide where the components that we talked about, the, especially the run element, where it's API driven, it can be automated, it can be configuration managed. That is the power of Kubernetes. But you're not solving for Kubernetes. Be very, very careful. You're not building a cluster. You're not in a job of running Kubernetes. You're solving a problem where your uh, development teams or your customers can run their workload. That is the problem you're solving. You're not solving a problem how to run Kubernetes. Yes, that is part of it. But always think about the objective or the outcome you want. And you will find that Kubernetes does fit nicely because it provides you that level of scalability, it provides you that level of you know, resilience. You can plug things in to monitor it and make observability accessible to everyone. But there are some gotchas as well, which um, let's go through that. But just installing Kubernetes, as I said before, is not going to solve world peace. When you are building that platform, that mid, mid, mid uh, thing, whatever that was, think about the UX. What is the user experience? So if you have a solution, if you're building a platform which is powered by Kubernetes and your developers or engineers have to jump through 10 different steps or five different hoops or you know, do a yoga pose before you can, they can access mm -hmm. your cluster, something is broken. Focus on UX and learn from the product world, right? Like the product marketing or the product people, they do this, they do UX research as part of product development. If something is not good for your customers, you want to know early. And why would we not treat our Kubernetes or platform in the same way? If it is not good for our customers, we need to know. So focus on the UX. Consumability of your platform. You said we have a platform. If no one can access it, or you're going to air gap it somewhere, or you're going to put six or seven different restrictions on it, which just breaks the purpose of it, then how are you expecting people to interact with it? It's a question. Again, as I said, there will be more questions that I'll give you than solutions. But these are the questions you need to go and ask. That's how you will land in the solution. UX. Remember UX. If you're building a platform, think about UX. What's my UX? And reduce the amount of touch points in your platform. So if somebody, an application needs to be onboarded on your platform, don't have five or 10 or 15 steps. Every one is plenty already. Start always thinking, think in, think in those terms. I need to reduce my touch points. Question. So more a comment. UX does not mean UI. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot actually of a very good point. UX does not mean you need to build a pretty website for your Kubernetes. Don't, just don't. UX is consumability. How is your user experience? Right? Um, and one of the key way I have found it's very helpful for me is either doing empathy sessions with your development team, customer empathy sessions, which is pretty much you get them in a room and ask them, hey, how do you actually deploy on our platform? And they will tell you, the experience is shit. I don't want to touch your platform. And don't get offended. That's their feedback. Then you start drilling into it. Okay, all right, what are the problems? How can we solve it? You will be very surprised. They do not care about all those tools we looked at. All they want is their container running in the cluster. So do this journey mapping with your engineers or your dev teams. Do the customer empathy sessions. Um, ooh, duplicate? Yeah, maybe duplicate. Yes, it does fit nicely. Um, <laughs> think about abstractions, right? Now, this is a kind of a more philosophical one, but Kubernetes is complicated plenty. It is 
absolutely complicated. It's not easy. And if you expose your internals of your platform or cluster to your dev teams and expect them to learn everything about Kubernetes, it's going to make their life very difficult, right? So what do I mean by that is, let's say if you have an application or if you run a cluster or own a cluster and to deploy to this cluster, someone needs to create a config map. And let's just say you're running Istio, right? Somebody needs to create all the configuration for Istio. Somebody needs to go and configure all the configuration for observability, like a Elf stack or whatever. There's a lot that people have to do, and they have to understand how it works. My recommendation would be build an abstraction around it. Give them a single way where one single YAML or some sort of CRD can be helpful for them, and it will create their app stack. Or maybe create Helm charts for that matter application helm charts, where they can just provide some configuration and generates all the YAML. But please, please don't force people to learn Kubernetes. I don't. I run the meetup, and I've been running training as well. Please don't force people. They will start hating you. They will start hating the platform, and they will not adopt it. Right? Now, last thing. Sorry. Uh, how much do they need to learn? So yes, that's actually a very good question. How much do they need to learn? So if you think about you got a Kubernetes cluster up and running, and if you think that's your job done, then they need to figure out everything about Kubernetes. How does namespacing work? How do network policies work? How do everything work? Whereas if you go a couple of layers above and build abstractions where they can you can they can use still use kubectl, but just poke one YAML in into your cluster and it runs, I think that level is okay, where they can still use kubectl in their pipelines or whatever, but still interact with your cluster. They should not be spending time learning about network policies or namespaces or resource quotas for that matter. You need to abstract somewhere. Um, one thing I would mention is when you're running applications on the cluster, please take all the telemetry, expose it or not expose it, don't expose it. That's how Medibank happened. But take all the telemetry. Shit, this is recorded, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll edit it. So you take all the telemetry and externalize it somewhere. Use systems like Elastic, use systems that provide you observability, like whatever, whatever is your flavor, right? Sumo, New Relic, whatever. But don't force people to go into your platform and figure out by, you know, kubectl or anything. That's just horrible interface. Think about um, one use case I use, the way I always solve this is if at 3 a.m. somebody woke me and said, hey, this is not working, where will I start? Start punching them, do something else, or what will I want to do? Think of that always, right? Don't punch people. That's one nice. Um, and again, when you build certain systems, build it to a degree where non-engineers can also reason with it. Obviously, you don't expect them to go kubectl scale or whatever, but they can reason with it. Architecture. Now, again, where does Kubernetes fit as the very ident I, I didn't actually look at this image. It looks pretty grim, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's okay. Um, architecturally, where does Kubernetes fit? I think it is one of the, I would say it is one of the central cog wheel or cog, cogs? Is it cog in the wheel, cog in the wheel or whatever you call it. It's a central piece of your big puzzle. Building a platform is not just running Kubernetes. It's thinking about CI, CD, thinking about observability, thinking about security, thinking about everything around it. Kubernetes is the center puzzle piece, which enables all of this. So never, and something I say is Kubernetes is not a strategy. It is part of a strategy. If you are writing a strategy document, or if there's an architect who gave you a strategy document and that strategy is we will install Kubernetes, question it. It's not a strategy. It can't be a strategy. Because it alone can't do much. Um, and Avoid building, like this is one of my concrete recommendations, avoid bin, building one large cluster for all the things in your organization. That kind of architecture makes no sense. And also, at the same time, avoid building micro clusters. Don't build cluster for each freaking um, app, right? There's a balance in between. Base it on what your teams need. Base it on what your organization need, your governance model. Sorry, question. I've got a question, and it's around that cluster balance, and it's a personal one, right? It's not one from the thing, right? So I've done a lot of kube work, right? So 
you know, for those in the room that don't know me, I was back in the day Red Hat. We released Kubernetes along with Google at the same time, right? So early days, right? When it did fuck all. Um, this is recorded, by the way. We'll edit it. We'll edit it. It's fine. <laughs> Fire truck all. So the question I have, right, is what I saw as a trend a few years ago, not today so much, but a few years ago was I saw this trend of, and I'm going to offend some people and I don't really care, I saw a trend of some VM getting into Kubernetes world and they sort of said, look, you know, we want one big cluster that does everything. And then I saw this trend of not micro clusters, but per business unit mm -hmm. because of the iteration speed and, you know, my business unit, which might be internet banking, is a bit different to the business unit over there that's just doing, you know, generating statements once a month. Mm -hmm. right we still want to be able to iterate fast but that speed is slightly different right so just from your experience because you see a lot of different clusters mm -hmm. right what do you find most organizations are doing are they doing not the micro one cluster pro no one does that as stupid <laughs> right but are you finding it's based on business unit are you finding it's based on dev squad what what are you seeing out in the real world yeah, so uh, there's a quite large variety of clusters I've seen, and generally people are constrained by what they are running it on. For instance, if they're on-prem, they tend to decide, we'll just build two giant clusters, one for prod, one for non-prod, then start hosting everything in there, which sometimes is okay model, but largely with the managed Kubernetes offering in the cloud, I'm seeing a shift towards more smaller cluster, as in business unit based, and even sometimes even smaller than that, but that's where the shift is. But again, before you go on deciding, you know, what's the industry trend or what everyone is doing, always go back to ask yourself a question. What is my governance model of my organization? Are policies applied across uh, for individual business units? Is it broken up that way? Or is it based on projects? Because that will give you a good indication how you should segment your clusters. And also there's another dimension. You should think about separating batch workloads from your normal workloads, GPU intensive workloads from your normal workloads. So those, the, there are a couple of dimensions um, of thinking about this. But government governance model of your organization plus the type of apps you're going to host. Cool. Next one, um, security. Now, Simon touched a lot about the, uh, about the security. <clears throat> I would just say one thing, and I've said this many times in many other talks as well in this group, Kubernetes by default is insecure. Don't be fooled that I'm running a Kubernetes, my job is done. You just started. Security is a whole new beast. So if you just stand up a cluster and then expect your teams to do the rest of it, like your development teams of it, that is what will drive the frustration. What my recommendation is Kubernetes has got a very mature controls model around it now, like there's CIS benchmarks, there are controls available, there are products like Orca, uh, shameless plug, I should get some free credits for, uh, products like Orca <laughs> that help you with security, use those and build controls as part of your cluster. So think of this, imagine this, right? You have a development team, they're running a, a Java application and a Golang application and maybe a Python application, right? If you have these clusters or collection of clusters or fleet or platform, whatever you want to call it, if it takes care of all your security controls, their job literally is reduced in half. Because trust me, building security controls is not an easy thing. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. So if you can provide them controls out of the box, which are baked into your platform clusters or fleet or whatever, that's half of their job done. And you can wrap it in some sort of a tooling like Orca again um, and provide them the visual, uh, visualization of it. But remember from this, if one thing you can remember is KH Kubernetes is not secure by default and do not offload the work to your dev teams. You um, as platform admin, Kubernetes admin, there's a role for us to play in here. Um, Business-wise, again, I, I think I've harped on about this a lot. Solve what matters to your business. Um, maybe just running a Kubernetes cluster is not the right thing for you. 
maybe Kubernetes is not the right thing for you. Be okay with that. Don't just go, no, everyone in the industry is running Kubernetes, so we have to Kubernetes. That's never the way. Solve what matters to your business. Um, and again, I think this, I said this before, you're not in the business of managing clusters until and unless you're an MSP, very different ball game. And finally, adopt the cattle, not pet mentality. Again, this is a cliche, I think we use it a lot, but it's relevant here. Uh, to start thinking about managing fleets of clusters. That's how you will drive automation as well. If you always think about, oh, I just have one cluster to manage. Trust me, I've seen this many places. You will have someone manually, um, um, not the word I'm looking for, but um, messing around with it. There was a word. <laughs> um, so think about building fleets where you're destroying clusters at will and you're automating as much as you can. Again, for the last few slides, again, I've not given you a direct answer where it fits, but I have given you the direction. Go ask yourself where it can lead. Sorry, question? How many times have you seen clusters get blown away and recreated at will? So the question is, how many times I've seen clusters get blown away and recreated at will? Not as many times as I would like. So why? first of all, the question is, why should you even do that, right? And again, in my experience, I've seen when you create a cluster, anything that lives for longer, again, not talking about humans, just for computers, they start accumulating side effects. A cluster, if you leave it running for years, it will accumulate side effects. And by side effects, I mean a very well-meaning engineer will go in and like, let me just create this God mode role because there's an urgent problem I have to fix. They will do it and then forget to delete. That's a side effect. Now think about the vulnerability there, right? Well-meaning folks do this. So if you are in the habit of destroying your clusters, recreating them, you can ensure this side effect does not accumulate for long. You can ensure that the state of your fleet, clusters, platform, whatever you want to call it, is exactly as you intend. Question. It's not a question. It's just a comment that appeared in the chat. Um, online, because we've got like 30 odd people online, right? So the actual meetup is twice the size of the people in the room, right? And they are quite vociferous. Um, so it's, there's a 10 cent word for you. So the comment is uh, from Faisal, and it says, I believe every company should really have a different environment for their setup. And, you know, if they're not following the separation of environments, then it shouldn't really be a Kubernetes issue. It's a wider issue. Yeah. Right. And it should be driven by enterprise architecture. Yes. You know, and other organizational sort of factors. Right. And I'm on board, Faisal. I'm there. Right. Yeah. No, definitely. Absolutely. I agree with it. Um, except the enterprise architect bit, but that's okay. I agree with it because, you know, um, it's not just a Kubernetes problem. And that's where I'm my focus is step away from Kubernetes for a sec. Think about what you're doing, ask these questions, and you'll come up with solutions. If you're using Kubernetes, fine. If not, you'll come up with solutions regardless for whatever you're using. So think about these things. And lastly, I'll just summarize all things we've discussed. It's at the end of the day, running Kubernetes is very, very difficult. It's not an easy task. You do need people dedicated to doing this. Um, I would recommend in this day and age, don't do it yourself. Running your own Kubernetes, hand crank Kubernetes, I would not recommend it. Go for a managed service if you can. If you're on-prem, tough luck. But if you're on-prem, <laughs> you would have to, right? Uh, but still, there are ways, mechanisms, scripts that you can run that simplifies your job. Um, and as I've said before as well, look at your internal governance boundaries. Think about how your governance is structured internally. What are your governance processes? How do you manage risk? How do you manage uh, flow of work? How are teams divided? And then base all of this decisioning, where does Kubernetes fit in there? Now, so far, it sounds like almost I've been selling the snake oil that Kubernetes is great. It is. It is absolutely the best for the reasons around the uh, meetup group. But there are some challenges. There are absolutely challenges. Um, and we'll whiz through this, right? 
um, modular, modular, modularization of cluster creation. It has been challenged. I think, I don't know how many years we've been doing Kubernetes, but still modularizing it, it has been a pain point. At many organizations, I've seen this. And there is yet an organization I'm yet to see that has zero click ops. There's some element of click ops here and there. Maybe you folks are doing zero click ops. Um, another big challenge is, uh, challenge is that the centralized configuration management, again, there has been a lot of improvement in it with Flux CD, Flux V2, and Argo CD, but centralized configuration management still remains a challenge. Why? Because if you think about it, just step away, forget about Kubernetes, you're managing configuration at two layers. One is your platform, be it your cloud, your cluster, or whatever. Then the next level of configuration is your application and workload configuration. So there are two levels, and it will always be a challenge. How do you centrally manage it? Uh, and I'm not saying it's an unsolved problem. It's a challenging problem. Um, and then the whole thing around ability to create and tear down clusters, right? Like not many places do this. Um, not many places even practice this regularly. Just think of clusters in terms of fleet and you will start seeing the shift in your thinking. Other bits of challenge, as I said, zero click ops, um, frictionless, and I may be a copy paste, but from an observability perspective, one of the challenge I've seen, um, no, it's not a challenge, but what I've seen across organization, for some odd reason, people love managing Prometheus. I, I mean, it's a great tool, don't get me wrong. It's a great tool. But my the way I architect it these days, it's a scrape and forward architecture. I still use Prometheus, but I use it to scrape and forward it to some external Prometheus. The beauty of this is I do not have to manage the storage on the cluster. I do not have to manage the Prometheus on the cluster. Just scrape it, send it to each cloud provider's, uh, provider has a managed Prometheus service these days. So think about those. This is still a challenge. How do people do observability? Then if, if you are doing observability, how do you think about customer journeys and things like that? Um, and lastly, I think there's there's a steep learning curve to Kubernetes. And this is no joke, although this is a build up to something which I'm going to share next, but it has a steep learning curve. Insecure by default, as I said, lots of day one and day two challenge people. I don't know for some odd reason. This is I've seen it as multiple organizations, large and small. Getting Kubernetes installed. People just think that's the battle won. That's where it actually starts. Um, so yeah, there are lots of day one, day two challenges. Be mindful of those. Be aware of those. Because at the end of the day, you're not running Kubernetes. You're building a platform. You're providing an interface for people. And you need skilled people to run and manage this. It's not, I mean, yes, uh, you can run it, but you do need skills. You need to know when shit hits the fan at 3 a.m., you need to know what you're doing. Question. So there's a question uh, from the group online. Uh, so MD says, I'm a big fan of Kubescape. We also yeah. use Prisma Cloud. Mm -hmm. Scott won't inject his own opinion there. Um, but he felt the Prisma Cloud is overkill and really pricey to achieve the same if you have Kubescape, Kubescape and Dartree plus Falco, et cetera, et cetera. So question mm -hmm. one, how do you feel about those differing security tools? They all seem sort of, you know, they're all ice cream, you know, of varying flavors. Yeah. And then question two is focusing on the NSA scale, what score do you think is good enough? Oh, that's a very and interesting one. Question one first. Yeah, okay. Um, very interesting. Okay, so shameless plug first. So if you are interested in security on Kubernetes, I am talking at a conference on uh, Tuesday and then Thursday in Sydney. So definitely come along. Discount coupon will get you there. So that was the shameless plug first. Next, how do I feel about security tools? Look, I first stop. Uh, let's not worry about the tools first off. I definitely feel there is a need for building a layered security approach around Kubernetes and tooling is one part of it. So for me, it's a necessity. I don't think it's a compromisable thing. You need some sort of tooling to help you with assessments and uh, vulnerabilities, scanning and everything. Now, on the question of tooling, 
what tooling you go for i think it depends again it's a consultant's answer but it depends if you're on large organization you're in a business like you're running a bank or whatever or whatever prisma cloud i think definitely will work because it's a large scale um platform it provides that central aggregation with twist lock in pipelines and twist lock on the cluster orca security shameless plug there um is also a, uh, a very good tool but if you're running let's say a small shop you are just compiling open source products then yes they are open there is a lot of open source alternatives like uh, uh cystic i think falco uh, cystic falco also has a paid offering um and cubescape for me i think that is regardless i will plug it in in my ci cds and anywhere because it gives you that assessment um on the spot so for me i think yes it's a blended answer but i would always go back to are these tools required yes what kind of tools are required depends on the a financial um situation b the value for money and c what you're comfortable with is how i would phrase it i've worked across all those tools by the way so that's why um what's next okay so we are at the end of where it fits so let me just summarize all of what we talked right um, i've spoken about what of how kubernetes came about what were the problems it was addressing why it should have been the savior why it is not the savior because you know the reasons again i haven't given you a particular answer where it fits today but take all of these questions and this mental model back and if you are running kubernetes or building kubernetes ask those hard questions what are the problems we are solving what do our customers actually want what is the journey of our engineering customers through our platform do not just i will install kubernetes i think one of the fallacy is you install it and they will come it's not going to happen let me just tell you it never works it will not work so please do not just install it and they will come now we looked at some of the challenges and i'll very briefly spend some time about educates so the whole genesis behind educates is over the last many years and i think we used to do this as part of our user group as well before covid i used to run kubernetes 101 sessions where it would be a dual track situation a presenter would be here in a separate room i would be just do teaching 101s kubernetes now i've done that at many places and then we um we went to one of our clients and we kind of took them on the journey as well and something just a bright spark lit up it's like why don't we do it for everyone teach people kubernetes that's where the idea started because kubernetes is challenging is not an easy thing it is very challenging and that's where the idea started from but then we iterated on the idea and one thing led to the other and eventually we thought about you know what there are small things in our industry that just people need some little bit of education like for instance how to do good architecture continuous design thinking sre how many people have that in the title but still don't know what freaking slo sli sla is trust me you will find many <laughs> how many people do you know uh, you know call themselves the devops engineer but when you start talking about dora or dora metrics they don't know and again nothing to be shameful about it's just we saw the gap and we thought you know what let's just do this um and literally the vision is just very simple there is a massive adoption of cloud and cloud uh, cloud native technologies today and there is a skill gap so all we want to do is play in that space help people upskill and build that bridge that gap um towards the end of last year we ran a couple of community workshops and some folks who were here were in those community workshops at the end of the day the purpose is just education not selling you enabler not selling you anything just educating people obviously for some money but businesses can take care of that um uh, so, so one question that i get asked a lot um is why educates is better than the other other providers and my differentiator factor as in the online places my differentiator factor is and i don't know if how you folks feel about it but watching 100 hours of videos yeah it's not my I, i can't do that and and we have seen places as well thank you where there's a high drop off rate when you force people to see 200 hours of video it doesn't it does it has a very low success rate hence we thought about this will be a, from an educate perspective from get go 
this would be in-person interactive training courses where we go in and teach people they, where they can raise their hands, ask questions and interrupt us and learn with everyone. It's, um, yeah, we've had few courses. I won't bore you with all of this, but yeah, we've had some successful courses. Um, and yeah, we are here for the win. So that's all I had today, Kubernetes and then slightly pitching educates. But yeah, thank you very much. What level do you need to do this educates? Um, you could question. be, you could be, you know, very tricky question. So the question is, what level do you have to be to, um, what level do you have to be to join educates or do educates course? It's actually catered at all levels, um, beginner level, expert level, because it's, comprises of hands-on labs, which are built from experience of what I've seen in the industry. Funny enough, one of the organizations reach out to us and they're like a vendor organization. And I created a course, Kubernetes for pre-sales. Kubernetes for pre-sales. I did not in my life imagine I would do that, but I did that. Because if everyone is adopting Kubernetes, you need the knowledge to go and have a con conversation with people. Um, there's one new one coming up, which I call the Kubernetes Business and Sales Essentials. Same course, just different spin. <laughs> Rinse and repeat, as they say. So that's the answer. Question? Not so much a question, but just a comment. Um, so thank you. We love it. It's awesome. I think there's another real question but when that's done i will just talk about our second sponsor of the night so for people who are online do not leave there is a chance to win stuff yes question yes it's working it's not just working it's working right yeah, yeah. yeah. so um i want to know more about that the consulting things so according to experience what we what what was the other the most demanding area in QB for the consulting? For example, a small scale company or oh, right. company. Yeah, I am also sensitive to share. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting question. So the question is, I'll just repeat it for the sake of it. Um, the question is, and correct me if I got it wrong, from a consulting perspective, where's the most demand for Kubernetes? Is it in small scale, um, higher, large scale enterprises and things like that? I'll split it into two parts and answer it in two parts. From an adoption of Kubernetes perspective, my what I'm seeing, there's a broad spectrum adoption. Every company of every scale and size is looking to adopt Kubernetes. Obviously, in the startup world, there is less because they have smaller applications. Serverless should be their go-to. And I advise against Kubernetes for startups anyway. I mean, depends on your workload, I guess. But largely speaking, there's a broad spectrum adoption everywhere. Uh, from a uh, consulting requirement perspective, larger, and again, it depends on each each scale of organization has different worries. Like large enterprises, of, of, especially after the Medibanks and the others, are worried about security. So we get a lot of queries around, hey, can you come and have a look and inspect and do an assessment? Are we secure or not? That is the big concern, and that's how most of the... Um, area of operation. Also in larger organizations, not every organization does it in the right way. Um, what I mean by that is you will see certain organization we are still struggling to get it off the ground. They can't get adoption. People don't want to adopt it. And the reason for that is what we covered in the talk, like build it for the people what they want. Just don't stand up a cluster and think people will come and run their apps. Um, for smaller scale organizations, what I've seen is, and this is very interesting, though, but for small scale organization, security is not front and center. It's kind of like a secondary concern, what I've seen. But for them, it's mostly about scale, observability, DevOps maturity. So that's where they're using Kubernetes and get us to help them out in that regard. So answer your question? Well, oh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think just yeah, showing, yeah, showing your experience, I think, yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. Cool. Um, oh, yeah, no. So, yeah, that does answer the question is what I got. Any other question? Question at the back? Since 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, what is the approach for performance testing? So I think what I've seen broadly, uh, larger organizations invest in tools like, um, what's that Scala Java one? I just had the name and I forgot. But the, broadly what I've seen, the larger organizations invest in a tool suite or a uh, tool chain, like which, which will just hammer the application, the front end application. But in larger organization, you will have Kubernetes that operates at multiple layer as well. There will be a front end layer that's hosting your ingress side of things. Then there is a back end layer and there's different ways of testing those. The other thing that is very prevalent at the moment and a lot of people are looking to get into is chaos engineering with Kubernetes, just destroying your workloads at random. I just said, don't invest in a tool, get me in. I can do <laughs> that any day. But yeah, to answer your question from performance perspective, uh, Gatling, Gatling is one of those tools I've seen used a lot. Um, there is another tool, open source tool called Hey. I've seen that used a lot. Um, but yeah, people just use those tool chain plugged into their CI CD. K6. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I have seen that used a lot. And not only just Kubernetes, funny enough. Uh, there's a customer that we are helping out, and they're using some sort of. Um, acceptance testing and they like fire it up a no, no head browser and then test it for that. But yeah, I have seen K6, not much, but yes. For larger enterprises, they love to buy a tool and then plug it in. K6 is more in the startup, not startup, but the mid-tier uh, companies. Good question. Any more questions? Scott? It's not a question. It's just me interjecting as the speaker and so on. Um, thank you. I love the fact that you are so knowledgeable. And yes, you will get chocolate. <laughs> this is a thing between Prateek and I, for those of you that don't know, my wife is a chocolatier like professionally. And he's been badgering me for chocolates for 12 months. Yeah, more than that. I have not delivered. <laughs> So, you need to go back to first principles and ask some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, need, you need to ask my wife, not me, right? <laughs> no, cool. No, so, look, thank, thank you very much. But yeah. So, so thank you. We do have another sponsor for the evening, and I'd like to introduce him to get up, say a few things. Up you get, man. Graham. That's you. Yeah, man. Up you get. So this, make, this definitely on. tells me how awake people were during my time. <laughs> make, <laughs> hang on. Hang on. Stop, 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 stop. Make sure that you are on camera. Camera is here. And you have a microphone Hello. that is not providing feedback. This is the microphone. But I so, won't, I'll assume it's on and I don't have to tap it. Please adjust the uh, camera to get your T-shirt. So, oh, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're and that will tell the one. people who are online Hello. where he is from. He so is for those from playing Docker. at home, my name is Graham. I work for Docker, which is very exciting. We haven't actually had a contingent in APAC but until about two months ago. So I saw this pop up and reached out to Stephen and then the organizers. And um, obviously, you know, everyone's been so gracious to have me along. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great session. Um, and thank you again to serious people for having us all here. So I wanted to come along, say good day. Uh, you're going to see a lot more of us. We want to engage the community and learn about how we can help you develop your skills, how we can best you know, present the new features that we're rolling out, and how we can best collaborate with the community to make sure that we're providing value with the amount of investment that you've given us over the years. As a first step to that, I thought I would come along and uh, give away a little bit of swag. We don't have a lot. We've got oh, there's the smiles in the audience. Um, we don't have a lot, and I don't want to really do a joker situation and throw it in the middle of the room and you all just kind of fight over it, which, while would be funny, I see the smile <laughs> on your face, um, I thought I would come along and introduce myself and give it away. So let's uh, – or do, it, do we do it afterwards for the recording to start? Or do no, it now? no, no, go for it. Right, go for it. Turn the camera around and see the chaos. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> So let's uh, let's do it this way. I've got a couple of shirts, a cap, a couple of pairs of socks, and some stickers. And for those playing at home, I'm sorry, stickers. <laughs> sneakers. This is if Docker starts making sneakers, then I'm 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 all in. I'm all, yeah, exactly. 
Oh, get, get Kobe on the line. That'll be good. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 let's start simple. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, can I have a show of hands in the audience? Who uses Docker? Never heard of it. Okay. <laughs> right. We all disqualified. You don't get any stickers. I think I've already given you one though. Uh, I was going to say, raise your hand if you use Docker desktop. Okay, a few of you, a few of you. All right. I'll make uh, marketing is going to ask me to ask this question, so I'll just throw it out. This is for a T-shirt, potentially a pair of socks, depending on your answer. So make it good. Uh, first, want to put the hand and tell me two reasons why you like using Docker. Anyone? Okay. Oh, gentleman here. Yeah, portable. You're portable. Yep. Second, second reason you like using Docker. Yeah, um, I can do the instant as uh, the women for things I can easily speak about. Yeah, compared to you know they, you know they. I need to ask about there's some operator and to speed up a computing. Yeah, but with Docker, I can immediately to do even that in two two a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So the ability to use Docker at two a.m. in the morning, um, I think, as well to run applications and ship them to using any environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you get a T-shirt. Okay. You're welcome. Um, now, for a T-shirt, cap, and socks, pop quiz. Docker just released a feature in 4.17 build kit that allows users to have a software com uh, composition analysis, including dependencies and also software bill of materials. It then also provides you with accurate uh, vulnerabilities and then remediation steps. What is this feature called? Released in 4.17 recently. Does anyone know what this feature is called? Get on the Google people. Google. All right. Uh, what is it? Next, next question. That was a hard one. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Okay. Multiple choice. All right. We'll, go, we'll give out multiple choice on this one. Is it A? I've got to think of multiple choice answers now. A. Uh, Docker. Uh, this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Is it Docker uh, Scout? Is it Docker Siren? Or is it Docker Pod? Raise your hand and give me an answer. You've got a 33% yeah. chance. You don't count! <laughs> and I think Scott's just raised his hand for another reason, so that's confusing. Um, anyone have a guess? This is for a shirt, Siren. a hat. Siren. 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 What was your name, sir? Nathan. Nathan. Congratulations, Nathan. Yay. It's good to see that uh, Google's equivalent to ChatBT Chat in their search engine is doing strong. <laughs> um, Docker Scout is the correct response. Download it now in the 4.17 build kit. Um, so is I will. Uh, desktop only or? Desktop and hub. Okay. Yep. Desktop hub. It is an early stage access, so it is obviously uh, just starting out. The features will be rolling in, but it's a very exciting step that we're taking. Um, so I will organize those. Thank you again for having me. You'll see potentially a survey come out uh, to try and get engagement as to what kind of topics you would like to see from us, from our champions, and from Docker in particular. So we'd love your engagement. Thank you very much. You're going to be talking at the Kubernetes meetup? In the Kubernetes, well, if I'm invited back, you'll be oh, invited absolutely. Back. I mean, I, please, I've got all kinds of like whale puns I haven't even thrown at you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear one then. <laughs> okay, well, I, I can't containerize my excitement. And, uh, well, what, you can't, no, you can't mock me now. You've asked for it. No, 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 my mistake. Sorry, you my bad. <laughs> no. Next. No, no, you only get, you only get one. No, I'm going to save them. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> and thank you for coming. And uh, I'll see you next time. Oh, yes? No, you just want to raise your hand. I think you're trying to get my attention. No, yeah. For, for the folks who are online, thank you very much for attending. And thanks, Cam, for oh, my pleasure. being a sport and you know, providing the swag. So, yeah.